Today we look across the landscape at Croom Park and see a fine 18th century country house surrounded by a landscape park, both designed by Capability Brown, all maintained by the National Trust. It's easy to forget that the house was once at the heart of one of the largest agricultural estates in Worcestershire, covering 15,000 acres, and included the Coventry family, household staff, the home farm, and over 600 tenants and their families who depended on the estate for their livelihood. So as well as assessing the impact of the First World War on individuals, it will be interesting to see how it affected a whole community. The Earl was by all accounts greatly loved and respected, a paternalistic landowner who genuinely cared for his tenants. As a renowned agriculturist, he embraced new ideas and techniques in agriculture, fruit cultivation and land use. For over 40 years, he had increased the number of allotments, orchards, fruit farms and small holdings on his estate. He had tried to set up his own small-scale local jam factory in the 1880s, but it failed long before the war in the face of larger-scale competition. One of the surprises for me during this research is the extent of government control over agriculture and food production, regulating every aspect of what could be grown, sold and eaten. The Earl openly challenged some aspects of government action on food supply, but equally seems to have accepted orders such as those to break up land out of a sense of duty and patriotism. The estate also faced the challenge of new competition to its land holdings from outside entrepreneurs. Men like William Deakin, an established jam maker from Wigan, who with the benefit of an army jam contract, bought up huge amounts of land bordering the estate for fruit plantations and after the war sold up and moved on. The present project has a number of key areas of research. Coventry family history, the estate workers, tenants and their families on the estate, links to the market garden and fruit growing industry of nearby Pershaw, changes in agriculture and fruit cultivation, and the longer term impact of the war on the families, the estate and the landscape. It uses local and national archive material and family stories where available. There are still some people in the area who at one time worked for the estate and whose family associations stretch back several generations and some are now National Trust volunteers at Croom. It's been noticeable that memories of family history going back to the Great War can be muggle, muddled or vague. An oral history project at Croom over 10 years ago included only one man from an estate farm who had fought in the war. And when asked what it was like, his only comment was, it was awful. <laughs> the stories of the ordinary women living and working on the estate have been particularly difficult to find. The World War I in the Vale project is gathering information on the middle class women who served on multiple committees in Pershaw, and it will be interesting to find out what, if any, activities estate women labourers were involved in. It's difficult now to imagine living as a community of estate tenants. Did they consider themselves as a different entity from the surrounding district? Lord Coventry, with Lord Coventry as a paternal figure? How far was their relationship to the estate and the Coventry family changed by the impact of the war? Was there a change throughout the war relating to the recipients of food production from the estate? My research on Croom will be published in 2017-18, plus an article will be published in a history journal on the jam industries in Worcestershire. <laughs> um, the war certainly caused financial difficulties, and in 1921, Lord Coventry, then in his 80s, handed over to an estate trust. His last letter to his tenants included the following. No doubt if I had consulted my own interests, I should have sold a considerable proportion of the estate but at my time of life, I could not bear 
the idea of severing my connection with those who have for so long been associated with me in good and bad times. Thank you. Lord Coventry always gets the last word. <laughs> um, next up, we've got Janice Lomas, who I've got written down here as an independent researcher, but who has been looking a lot into war widows, I believe. Yes, so. and women who got the separation allowances in the war. Um, yeah, but, but I'm, I'm concentrating on the private soldiers' family. It was very different for officers. So we're just looking at private soldiers, which of course were the overwhelming majority of all the soldiers who fought in the First World War. So um, in 1914, three days after the war started, Asquith announced that from now on, all soldiers' families would be getting separation allowances for the first time. So this changed, changed things considerably. Uh, from what it had been before, where uh, widows and, and uh, soldiers' wives were very dependent on charity for any support they got. But now they would be, have a government allowance, you know, so this was greeted with great um, joy until they knew how much it was. Um, <laughs> but it was very, very small amounts that were paid at the beginning, 55 pence a week for a soldier's wife, uh, 9 pence a week for each child. And war widows' pension was totally unrealistic. They got 25 pence, the equivalent of 25 pence a week. After an outcry, this doubled to 50 pence a week. But it still wasn't really enough. Well, it wasn't enough to live on. You couldn't live on that. So once again, charities stepped in and they, for the first couple of years, they administered charity, charities' money, topped up pensions, and it was a chaotic mess of a system for the first two years. Uh, in the end of 1916, they set up a ministry to deal with war pensions for the first time, the Ministry of Pensions, and that was going to sort everything out. Um, government had thought that mostly single men would flock to the colours in the first, you know, uh, fervour at the beginning of the war, but actually an awful lot of married men did join up and um, the, this sort of fueled a moral panic which ensued whereby they thought that women without men and uh, with government money would be at uh, you know drinking, uh, not looking after the children, committing adultery here there and everywhere and that there would be a massive crop of war babies born. Um, all of which, most of which didn't happen, but uh, it, that was the perception. So women who had separation allowances were denounced from the pulpit. There was a, a clergyman called Canon Burroughs who said that 18 shillings a week, that's 80 pence, I think, uh, and no husband were heaven to some women who once were industrious and poor, but were now wealthy and idle. Um, as, as the war went on, women could earn, you know, two or even three pounds a week. Um, so by no means could 80 pence a week, which is what separation allowance was, be counted as riches. But if, uh, if a woman could combine paid work and the separation allowance, for some women they were probably better off than they'd ever been in their lives because they hadn't got the men to keep who, who you know, did take the lion's share of the family budget because you'd have to keep the breadwinner going. Um, so now they were, some women, I think, were better off than they'd ever been. And one woman who had a drinker for her husband was quoted as saying, they can keep Bill forever. Um, which, <laughs> you know, you do have some sympathy with. But for women who had got... So children and were trying to live on the separation allowance, especially as time goes on and the pension um, doesn't go as far, prices are going up, scarcities, and they're trying to live on separation allowances and pensions. They have very, very hard time, very, very little amount of money. So um, because of all these worries about how women were be going to be behaving, 
the response of government was to try to place restrictions on them. And um, they tried all sorts of things. There were curfews in place uh, in some towns where, where soldiers' camps were, um, so that women shouldn't go out in the evening. They had women's police patrols, and they were patrolling places like the parks and the, and the camps and uh, any bits of open ground and uh, all that sort of thing. Um, they even tried to stop some unaccompanied women from entering pubs. Um, so there was a great deal of suspicion, much, much um, like Stella was saying about how women, working class women were viewed, you know, as sort of under suspicion and in need of being watched. You know, you had to watch them. So um, this is, so how did they go about sort of judging whether women were worthy of a pension or not? Because it was felt by the government that these women were receiving money at second hand. They hadn't done anything to earn it. Their husbands were earning it and they were getting it. So they were getting it at second hand. So they had to be worthy of the pension. And that meant being respectable and morally upright. And so no pension was to be given to those who were deemed unworthy. Any woman found to be unworthy had her allowance terminated or suspended. And we can see a continuity here with the poor law and the idea of the deserving and undeserving poor. Um, and that was to continue as the Ministry of Pensions came into being at the end of 1916. There was an attitude which, um, once again, Stella mentioned and Karen did, about how um, working class wives and widows were thought to be, at worst, drunken slattens, as they were called, or at best, uh, on a par with servants, and therefore in need of being watched. Got to watch them, I'll say. Won't behave properly. To police this system of separation allowances and pensions, war pension committees were set up. Karen was talking about the food committees, and Stella mentioned the... Um, uh, another committee, I think committees are a theme today, committees and jam, aren't they? Really are the two themes of the day. So they set up these war pensions committees in every major town. And once again, these committees were manned by volunteers and the same sort of people who'd sat on other boards, which uh, is, was very obvious, people who'd sat on poor law boards, workhouse boards, food control committees, all the same sort of people man these committees. And the purpose of the War Pension Committee was to determine whether women were fit to have an allowance. And they investigated any complaint about a wife or a widow um, which left women open to any malicious charge. So if you fell out with your neighbours or there was a rumour going round that you'd been seen in the pub with a man or anything like that, and it got back to the War Pensions Committee, they would investigate this. And while they were investigating it, they would administer the pension on your behalf, which meant that you wouldn't have any money, but you might have some food stamps, or you might have a, a load of coal delivered, or something like that, but you wouldn't actually have control over your money. And if they found the allegation to be proved, then they took your pension off you or altogether, your allowance off you altogether. Uh, they also had the delightful um, idea that they would write to your husband informing him of the facts. Uh, now, the effect that these letters must have had on men who were serving on the front, and you get a letter from the War Pension Committee saying your wife's been out on the razzle, as we'd say then. So, and they asked the husband if he wanted a divorce. And if the husband wrote back and said, yes, I, I would like a divorce, then they stopped her allowance and that was the end of her allowance um, for the rest of her life. So, um, the work of these local war pension committees were overseen by a, by a committee within the Ministry of Pensions 
that was called the Special Grants Committee. I always think it's a lovely title because it looks so innocuous. But actually their main purpose was to sort out which women deserved a pension or not, or, or an allowance or not. And they um, investigated even anonymous letters they investigated. Um, and almost half of the allegations against the women were not substantiated. But even so, the numbers who were not deemed worthy were high. And by the end of the war, 6,302 women had forfeited their separation allowance and an additional 547 had had, had their pensions administered by the committees. And also, 939 war widows, nearly 1,000 war widows, had forfeited their war widows' pension. Uh, they did, the way it was investigated, they had women on the committee coming round to your house and visiting the house, and they had police reports being done and everything. So even if, um, even if the complaint against the woman was found to be not proven after all the investigations, the very fact that somebody from the World Pension Committee had been to your house and that the police had been round and all that, it, it, you know, the woman was still tarnished her reputation in some of these close-knit communities. She would be very hard pushed, really, to, um, for it to remain intact, her reputation. So by 1921, 13,400 women had lost their separation allowances. Um, it's, it's a massive thing. And throughout the interwar period and throughout the Second World War, these charges of misconduct continued to be made against war widows uh, and people in receipt of separation allowances during the wartime. And all the systems of surveillance, pro probation and forfeiture were to continue throughout the interwar, throughout the Second World War and beyond. The Special Grants Committee was not disbanded until 1972. So I'll leave it there. I could, I could go on forever. I'm feeling very nervous now about all this government interference. I hadn't surprised to me as I'm listening to you and, and the other talks today. I'd always thought the state was quite small in the First World War and people were surprised by, but it seems its tendrils are everywhere. Mm. Yeah. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> what were we fighting for, I ask? Um, right, Julia is going to speak next. Julia is an oral historian and, um, and a very good one, actually, if you're running a project. Hi, Julia. Um, but she's been working very particularly lately with the Great Blackberry Pick project with Droitwich Library and some schools. So she's going to tell us a little bit about that. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. And I, and I feel very respectable and morally upright. I hope you do. Yeah. <laughs> um, great Blackberry pick. Please go and have a look at our stand at the back. It's a project that I've been involved with with Droitwich Library, and it's very much about mm. community engagement. Um, it all started um, when a reception teacher who happened to be her school history coordinator, um, came to me because she knew I did history things and said, I've got to do something on World War I 100 years, help. Um, and that started it all off. And then Maggie, who normally comes into everything, came into it, <laughs> as did this, which I have to show you, because it's um, a wonderful logbook from one of our schools that we work with, which is Hindlip First School in Fernal Heath. Um, and basically, uh, I'm just, in the sun, I'm going to sit down, um, log books are just a fantastic repository of all bits of interesting information, but the bits that we picked out that would really engage really quite young children were the stuff about blackberry picking, which of course leads on to jam, about which I need say no more at this point. <laughs> Um, so the idea for this project was to engage really young children. So there's quite a lot out there, particularly for uh, senior school children and even in the primary um, and middle school areas. But for the first schools, the really young children, how on earth could you get seven and eight year olds interested and involved? The schools kind of knew they had to do it. They wanted to do it. It was 100 years. You couldn't let it go by. There's lots of resources out there, but they weren't really suitable or local enough for their market. 
market. So that's kind of the place that we started at. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole project, so I sort of picked out a few things that surprised me or interested me, or the teachers came back and said this really worked. So I will kind of mention a few things, but I've just shoved together a couple of documents, if anyone wants to look at them at the back where we brought the teachers together and did a sort of session of feedback, and they came out with some really interesting things. Um, so do come and have a look if you want at the end. And also, we've got a website, and there's some um, little sheets with the website address on it. Um, there were four schools involved. They, we picked them deliberately, all small rural schools and all surrounding Droitwich. Um, they were Hindlip First School, Tiberton First School, Witchbold First School and Ombersley First School. I'm sort of pointing because they're kind of like in a circle around <laughs> Droitwich, roughly that way. Um, one of the ways that we made this project work is that we made the schools responsible for their own projects. So we said, look, we've got this money, we've got some expertise, we can come and start you off and give you some resources, but the rest is up to you. And I have to say, point one, that really worked. Because if you give the schools ownership, they'll do it. If you go and impose all the stuff or give them all the stuff, it's not their responsibility and they've got so many other responsibilities, it tends not to work so well. So that worked really well. And it also meant that all four projects were completely different and they were utterly fascinating and different. If there's a regret, it's that we don't have the opportunity to get the teachers together and with other teachers who haven't been involved to share what worked, what didn't work, what was um, you know, really good in their schools, etc. cetera. Um, okay, some things that shocked me. Um, there's a new word I've learned, which is wow events. And projects in first schools have to have wow events. So you have to have a wow to start and a wow to finish. So our wow to start was going blackberry picking, which sounds pretty straightforward. We teamed up with the Worcestershire Wildlife Trust and took each school blackberry picking. The wow for me was that most of these children, and there were 130 children, and I would say 95% of them had never been blackberry picking. And most of them, it was quite an exciting, but wet, muddy, oh my goodness, things might prickle me, sting me, insects, you know, they were really quite uh, about it. And the teachers were quite, oh, it's a bit dangerous. Oh. Um, and I exaggerate slightly, but only slightly, I'm afraid to say. Of course, they absolutely loved it. And they became really competitive. So it was who could pick the most blackberries and which school could pick the most blackberries. And all of the schools fed back to me afterwards that whilst they did so many other things, the blackberry picking itself was the thing that really stood out. And why it stood out was because they could, in the logbooks, it clearly details in some logbooks in more detail than others, but that the children were doing it 100 years ago. And the children got to look at the logbooks. Um, we gave them archive gloves, and they actually handled the objects, and they loved all that. The hands-on experience made them really connect with mm. small children 100 years ago. So that really worked well. The wow at the end, each school did differently, but that was another lovely thing because it tended to be a community thing. So for some schools, they had a tea party where they invited in parents and grandparents, people in the community, and fed them or sold them the jam that they'd made and the scones that they'd made and the cakes that they'd made. Others linked it to the week around remembrance and did some sort of remembrance service, but brought in all the things they'd done in their project, including one school did a dance representing what they'd done through the project. Um, so lovely end events. And these things really stick in small children's minds. Um, I've mentioned the logbook as a primary source. The other primary source that the children loved were the Princess Mary boxes. I don't know if anybody mm -hmm. knows about these. These, were, um, these came out in 1914. Princess Mary was responsible for them, but lots of children and families put forward funding and donations to pay for them, and they went to the troops in the trenches. Children loved this idea, so they made their own boxes, and in one of the schools particularly, they um, created these boxes. We linked up with a charity and sent them to the soldiers serving in Iraq this Christmas. So again, that was a lovely way of doing the then and now. And in fact, the HLF grant that we had is called World War One Then and Now. Um, so that was a super way to, to link the, the children then and what they were learning about from World War One to the current day. Um, Another thing for me that really came out of this, and I think really was really powerful for the teachers, was that you can actually cover all bases of the incredibly busy national curriculum through a topic like this. So we, as I say, sort of 
threw the first seedlings down of what this project could bring them. But they then developed it. And just going through, one of the documents I've put here is how it kind of hit every bit of the national curriculum. For example, well, the history one is pretty obvious, but literacy one, um, a lot of them got hold of a wonderful book, which I think you like, Maggie, called Archie's War, which is about a little boy on the home front. And it's done in a scrapbook style. So they did lots of Archie War, Archie's War type literacy things, but they made scrapbooks. Children have never made scrapbooks these day and age. They didn't know what a scrapbook was. They didn't get how you could put things in how you wanted, not how the teacher told you to. And they loved it. They loved being responsible for the look of their own uh, scrapbooks. Um, poetry people, we made poems and we recorded the poems. And that was lovely because the children, um, whilst if they were writing them down and you said, well, you could make that a bit better, they can't be bothered to write it all out again. If they're recording it and they hear themselves, they go, oh, no, 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 that doesn't sound very good. I'll do it again. So they really improved their own performances through recording the Blackberry poems. And we made a little feature for BBC Hereford and Worcester as well. Uh, one more thing that um, I loved about this was that it spread far and wide through the children's families and communities because, of course, the children went home and said, oh, we've been doing this. And then parents got out things and stuff which had been hitherto hidden in cupboards. And in one school, no, no less than three of these came in the next day. <laughs> Can you believe that? Three Princess Mary books in one class of 30 children. Um, and grandparents got out some records and stuff shared with children, medals came into schools. One little girl was taken by her grandma to a museum somewhere in Yorkshire, which had a huge display on her great great uncle. And she came back and shared that with the class. So it's these sort of repercussions that kept like a puddle sort of rippling outwards, which I thought was lovely. Then some surprising things happened. Um, for example, two of the schools came into the Library Round Remembrance to see their own displays and also to see the War Memorial, which was then obviously surrounded by all the poppies, which is a very poignant moment for anybody, but particularly for small children. Um, uh, the library staff have told me that soon after that, um, a dad came in with his little boy, who'd never been in the library before, didn't even know that Droitwich had a library. Um, and he came in and his son had got a library card through the project, and they'd come to you know, look at the children's section of the library. How great is that? It's only one, or only one that we know of, but I think that's fantastic. Um, what else did we do? Um, yeah, I, I won't go on, because I know that you're, I'm probably pushed for time, but I'm just going to mention the challenges, because it's not all been a bed of roses, as you can imagine. Um, the first challenge is getting into the primary schools and getting in to their already busy uh, timetables. Um, and for that, the key things were planning in advance. And that's one of the reasons why we've done this project now in 2015-16, because it's a sort of blueprint. What we wanted to do was see what was possible, see what the teachers could come up with, see what resources and research were suitable for small children, so that we could make a website and then share it with other schools in... 1718, 18 being the year that most of the blackberry picking references in the log books are all about, so let's call 1918 the great blackberry pick year. By 2018, so the 100th anniversary of the great blackberry pick, we could have schools all over the country doing this. <laughs> could we? <laughs> Would be great. That's an awful lot of jam, Julie. It's an awful lot of jam. <laughs> but children did, jam. most yeah. of the children didn't know where jam came from. They thought it came from the supermarkets. <laughs> <laughs> And they've all learned how to make jam, so that was really good. Um, a challenge that shocked me was how, you know, this is a bit off the point, but how you deal with 30 children in a class, some of whom are academically just bouncing off the walls, they can't get enough of it, and some of whom are right at the bottom of the academic spectrum, may have special needs, and you really can't deliver the same sort of hands-on thing in class to both spectrums. How the teachers do it, I don't know. Um, but by having helpers and a number of us in the classes, we did a pretty good job of that. But that is a challenge, a real challenge. But it's just a main, a sort of general challenge, isn't it, to schools today. Um, you can have one more. <laughs> have one more, OK. OK, I'll give you one more. Go on, then. I'll read you two comments that came back from parents. Um, this one, Emmy really enjoyed the topic. She learned so much and relayed her thoughts to us about what it was like to be a child during the war. She particularly liked the blackberry picking and seeing the display in Droitwich Library. And it was nice that she could talk to elder family members about it too. And then we have 
Zoe and Jess really enjoyed this topic. They learnt a lot and it really made them think about World War I and what had happened and how adults and children on the home front were affected. They particularly enjoyed the sale, both making of the things and selling them at the actual sale itself. Um, and in that sale, just a little aside, they made, in this particular school, they made little bookmarks um, and embroidered their bookmarks to sell because we'd looked at the embroidered cards that had come back from the trenches. And the teacher said to me, never come to me with ideas about sewing projects again. <laughs> I mean, they are really lovely, but she said, sewing with 30 children, nightmare. But anyway, they were lovely. And the parents bought them, and the money that were raised from the sales either went to the British Legion, Poppy Appeal, or went to another charity that make their own boxes, which are sent to the troops at Christmas at the end. Very nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> A report in a local paper, um, I, I think it was probably the Barrows Journal, in 1918, that the farmers weren't too thrilled at the thought <laughs> of all these children rampaging over their fields to pick blackberries. Oh, lovely. Farmers Can I talk to you about where that is? <laughs> yeah. Right, OK. Well, after rampaging children, we've got two minutes with you, Maggie. <laughs> um, so I'm aware Sorry, of Maggie. Yeah, OK. But, uh, yeah, no, you can, you can have your slot. So Maggie Andrews, uh, Professor Maggie Andrews from University of Worcester, also co-investigator for the AHRC-funded Voices of War and Peace World War I Remembrance <laughs> Hub. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Oh, no. is now fun. going to share a little bit because Maggie's been doing a large amount, I mean, masses of charging around the countryside, geeing up uh, community groups and as I say she's working on World War One in the Vale with, with us in Pershaw so she's going to share some thoughts. Okay, um, about two years ago from now we were um, in the sort of rev up to the First World War and we had on the televisions in the sort of prime time slot with lots of money put into it the um, sort of high status Jeremy Paxman series on World War I, which will make some in the room cringe quite badly. Um, at one point in it, he stands in a kitchen of what's supposed to be a, uh, a sort of First World War household, and he makes this great pronouncement about the way in which World War I affected the home front was that by the end of the war, there was an empty place at every kitchen table. Now, putting aside the fact that this is deeply inaccurate, <laughs> and actually, um, you know, we're talking about one in eight, one in ten, um, one of the things that I've really, really learned by doing the, the quite detailed work with these community groups is what a mythical notion of home and family and household that is. It's got this idea that there's, you know, two parents and children, and that the big tragedy that to occur to them in this four years of war is when a man dies on the Western Front. And it's always the Western Front in mythology, um, not Egypt or what have you. Um, and one of the things that's absolutely come through in the research in Pershaw and in Worcestershire has been the multiplicity of different households and families that there are. Mm. We've had lots of material from um, travellers' families um, who are coming in and out of the district at various different times of the year in relation to the fruit picking. They've got numerous children, some at the front, some who are small. They're up in court, constantly up in court, I have to say. Um, the Petty Sessions is absolutely obsessed with them for, th for, for quite minor things like stealing bacon and eggs. Um, and you get a very different sense. So a, they've got a different notion of household. We have a lot of widows before the war. One of my students got incredibly excited because mm. he found these widows at the end of the war running market gardens and he found them and he came rushing back. They were war widows. And Jenny pointed out they were well into their 60s and they clearly weren't war widows. Um, but we had forgotten that actually there are many single people in households. We discovered uh, very acrimonious, I have to say, in some cases, widows living with their sons, squabbling and yelling and ending up in the courts because they actually were left forced in enforced intimacy, really, of the poverty of living together and trying to cope in wartime. Uh, we found an enormous number of children who died during this period that we forget about. So just in the Pershaw graveyard lists, we have over 30 children who died during the war under the age of 18. Whereas in the Pershaw district, we have, which is much wider, we have 100 men. Now, I think that's a really interesting statistic that people forget about. And what we see is the tragedy and the trauma of many households is actually much more direct to do with the, the, the children who die in 
unbelievable accidents. Um, some of them, you know, 16-year-old girls died by being scalped when helping with the harvest. So really quite a different image that you get there. We also have the image of lots of single people living, the retired. Um, so we have the lovely single dressmaker who's frantically on the WI committee. I think she's there to keep to keep her peace with all the people she sells dresses to. But um, she, so you have that, that single, we also have the, the retired uh, domestic servant who's her shores, woman, on the Food Control Committee. Now these are quite different senses. Those households don't come into the popular mythology, I would argue, the popular idea of the family on the home front, and the very different experience that they have of that period of time. But in a sense, it's these sorts of households which are also involved in producing the food, preserving the food, and sort of preparing it throughout the war. That's Thank it. You. There you Thank go. you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.